Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast about everything deep sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me is the professor, Professor Alan Jameson. You all right, mate? Yes, I'm fine, Tom. That's a good sort of positive attitude, considering I know you're boiling in a cupboard. I know. It's ridiculous. <laughs> we have to record this one quickly before Alan cooks like a <laughs> slow roast. It's these uh, sort of flimsy houses in Australia. They don't really lend themselves to good acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a wardrobe again. And it's the hottest it's ever been on record. Yes, it is the hottest Christmas ever. So why not get in a cupboard? Yeah. It's a good way to lose weight as well. It is, yeah, it's like one of those sauna suits. Yeah. You'll lose a few pounds. Do you have a nice Christmas, Tom? I had a lovely Christmas, but you know I love Christmas. It doesn't take much to keep yeah. me happy. I've got some good rum. I've got a selection of good rum. Had some good Christmassy headaches. I didn't have anything. No, you were pretty dry. Every year. It's been every year for years. Everyone else goes off the booze on January. I just go off over Christmas. And Christmas is a kids' festival, isn't it? You don't go turn up to a kids' party and just get smashed in the corner. Well, kids seem to really like drunk people. And if you think about it, they're just clowns. Like, if you dressed up a drunk person as a clown, like the kids wouldn't know the difference. True. Oh, he's fallen over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, he's been sick. It's a funny clown. Well, before you cook, we've got some news over the festive period. Lots of, like, summing ups of the year. So there's lots of nice, like, reviews of deep sea discoveries over the last year. Will I dive in with my slightly dry, but I found interesting article about deep ocean circulation? Go for it. It was a sort of paleontological paper looking way back in, in the Earth's sort of climate history from ice cores and things like that. And they made a really cool model looking at what has affected the planet's climate and periods of sort of glaciation. And so basically it showed the importance of deep ocean circulation in the stability of the planet, basically. Antarctic warming and CO2 outgassing from the Southern Ocean can sort of reach a tipping point that affects the glaciation globally. And this is thought to be caused, it could be caused by weakening of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So one of the big circulations in the Atlantic that spreads heat and sort of exchanges gases all over the planet. So currently, the Antarctic bottom water is the deeper water mass, as it's very cold, but it's relatively fresh. And above it sits the North Atlantic deep water. Only at great depths does the thermobaric effect that we've talked about in the past a little bit, where the extreme pressure sort of generates a little bit of heat. Only in that sort of situation does the warmth of the North Atlantic deep water current make it less dense than the Antarctic bottom water. So that sort of decides which way they sit in the very deep ocean. So if there's any reduction in the temperature difference between those two water masses, they can flip. And that can happen sort of at quite a local scale. So if the origin of that water becomes a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler and they get closer together, regardless of what's going on at the rest of the planet, it can cause those two to flip. And then that has repercussions for how heat is dissipated around the planet. Their model suggested that this weakens the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. And during a glacial period, that will increase the polar seesaw response, which is basically when one pole is getting warmer, the other one's getting colder. And it increased the impact of that by a factor of two. And I think it also showed that it, it happened much more quickly. I'll put a link in the show notes. It seems to be an open access paper. It's quite a dense paper, but it was just interesting to show how these currents in the deep ocean regulate the whole planet and how changes to just part of the planet and part of that circulation can then have ramifications for the for the whole planet. So I've mentioned before that like one of my future anxieties and sort of climate change related anxieties is the disruption to the circulation, particularly in the deep sea. And in Earth's own history, you know, the deep sea has suffocated and died on multiple mass extinctions. So, you know, a lot, a lot of people often say like, oh, well, this is just a cycle. This is something the planet does, which fair enough, it's true. But in the past, in this cycle, 98% of life in the ocean has died. So just because it's happened before doesn't necessarily mean it's good and we should maybe uh maybe tread carefully on the button that makes that happen happy new year everybody i know i know look into the future and all that no that's a very very important story there tom it was also possibly one of the most boring news articles i've ever had to sit and listen to wow that was just boring and depressing yeah i'm afraid it's that it's interesting but yeah it's it's boring and depressing maybe is this one of these games that you have to start a new year with and the most boring sort of like apocalyptic message of doom and glooms because then the rest of the year can only get better yeah and to be honest even on micro scale like the these stories can only get better. <laughs> 
I'm very sorry to our listener who does feel a lot of climate change anxiety. Uh, I'm sorry to lead with that one, but that's it now. It's done. It's done. And you can doze off to the podcast while we just talk about nice critters for the rest of it. Yeah. Let's talk about something else quickly. And hey, Barry, I've been putting some interesting things out. Did you see the one about the giant phantom jelly? Beautiful big jellyfish. I did. Apparently, in 34 years of rummaging around the deep sea, they've only come across what... I don't know if this is the journalist or Embarra who put this in, but they called it a cagey crimson creature, and they've only come across it nine times. So there's some really interesting things going on in this one. So what they're saying is this is the ninth time they've found it in 34 years, which is cool because it's massive. It was at 990 metres. Its bell's about a metre of diameter, I think, and its arms seem trailing behind it some like 10 metres or something. But <laughs> what struck me was... I keep going on about the media and everything else, but this is a beautiful one. It says it was first discovered in 1899. Get this, by 2009, the creature had only been officially spotted 110 times in 110 years. <laughs> Good regular. In 2009. So that means, so obviously that's neat, right? That's really neat because the two numbers match. So we're now we're looking at 111 times in 122 years. That's ugly. So let's just keep referring back to the 2009. 110 times, 110 years. The weird thing about it was those arms are the oral arms. They're the mouth parts rather than the normal stinging yeah. tentacles of a Medusa. And from that video, one, I think it looks really beautiful and you get a sort of sense that it's huge. Do you not think it just looks really, really soft? Like, I want, yeah. I want to cuddle it. It looks like a, a beautiful billowing yeah. duvet. It just, it looks like it'd be so cuddly. A deep she cuddle. Yeah, especially because it doesn't sting. It's the oral tentacles, not the stinging tentacles. So uh, you could just wrap yourself up in that and have a lovely drift, lovely little pelagic nap. You've got a new happy place, Tom. <laughs> I have, I have. It's been gradually consumed by a jellyfish. Yeah, yeah. but they also saw the barley, which is interesting. Barleys are, you see them a lot when you troll, but seeing them alive is pretty rare. This is the fish that's got a gelatinous dome, so you can see these photoreceptors inside its head, and it has eyes that swivel through 90 degrees. It's very, very cool. And... Bizarrely, this was also the ninth time it was seen by M. Barry. I don't know what's going on with the numbers in this story. I wasn't sure whether they'd maybe mixed up the quote. So the Phantom Jelly's been, they've found it nine times, and they've found the bar line nine times. But it doesn't say how many times the bar line was seen in 110 years by 2009. No. Like you say, they're, they're seen a lot trawling. And again, the same with the jelly. These are two things that like we know of from trawls, but we didn't get the full picture because they're both incredibly fragile. So the barrel eye was known since 1939, but those were damaged specimens from trawling. So we knew about the barrel-shaped eyes, and we assumed that they were static. And it wasn't until 2009, where I think it was in Bari that spotted it for the first time then, that we knew about this domed head that looks basically like a fighter jet cockpit. It's got this clear dome that makes up the top part of its head. And I don't know how to say this, its eyes are inside its head. And I know that's true of everything, but like, its eyes are entirely inside its head, and it looks through its own transparent head. And that is amazing. That is insane. Do you want to cuddle that one as well? Most things, most things I'll cuddle down there. But this one I'll give a cuddle. How big are they, by the way? They're not too big. I think they're like uh, 20 centimetres I've got in my head, so less than a foot. Uh -huh. I don't know what gut instinct I'm basing that off. I think I have seen a picture of one of the troll specimens. but I remember uh, the ones that used to come up in the troll when we were working in uh, South Pacific, and they were, they were pretty small. They were the size of a phone. Sorry, I'm just looking at my phone. Yeah, that yeah. notorious technology that stayed the same size. Yeah. Did you see the handfish? <laughs> the walking handfish? It's back. It's back. We, we thought it was Endemic gone, but it's Australia, back. Australia, off Tasmania. And uh, this one, there's some, there's some more random numbers in this. This is the first time it's been spotted for 22 years. <laughs> Why must be so specific about <laughs> when stuff has and hasn't been filmed and how, how many times? But anyway, 22 years it's been since the pink handfish was sighted. And even then, it had only been seen four other times. Assumed to be extinct. And there it is, oh. waving its little hands, scurrying over rocks. It caught it on camera in a marine park off Australia, off Tasmania, 150 metres. So it's not really deep sea, but, you know. Ah, it looks like it belongs. We'll have it. I will take it, yeah. <laughs> Another one was the big Pacific football fish. It washed up on the shore in San Diego. Big angler fish with a big bioluminescent bulb. That's two in this year at least, isn't it? I guess if, if you're a deep sea fish and you're looking for a bit of legacy, it's always best to get yourself washed up near a major oceanographic institute. <laughs> Turn up on their doorstep, essentially post yourself to the experts. Yeah, otherwise you're just going to cook on a beach somewhere. Before the yeah. gulls get you. Beautiful, beautiful animal. Beautiful. It's in really good condition. Both of the ones this year have been in really good condition. Didn't the folk in Hawaii used to often go out after undersea seismic events because it would often kill a load of deep sea fish that would float to the surface? Oh, I didn't know that. Bit of pop trivia for you. Yeah, it's just brilliant. Like, there'll be some catastrophic undersea event and then... Uh, 
a load of stuff will float up. Do you want some other deep sea pop trivia? Oh yeah, sure. What connects deep sea science with eight million American cigarettes? Pass. Galathea expedition. They did smoke a lot on that, including the children, according to some of the file footage. The initial r- raising money for the expedition and had this thing that was going to be this massive sea monster, believe it or not, they genuinely believed there'll be a sea monster, and they were using that as a way to try and get public support and hence funding. So they started this expedition foundation, whose job it was to raise money. One of the ideas they had was to get Danish expatriates to contribute. And it turned out they were more than willing to help and they donated loads of money and goods. And they actually gave more than 8 million American cigarettes to the foundation, who then sold them in Denmark at a legal black market price to raise money for the expedition. <laughs> There you go. Wow. So if you want to do a big round the world expedition, study the deep sea, all you need really is to start bootlegging 8 million American cigarettes. Well, it's good to know there's always been funding problems for the deep sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite a novel way of getting around it, the way. Yeah. And on the back of this, I'd like to announce our new product line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That little smooth American taste. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's ace. Ambari did a, a lovely little roundup of their best in situ sightings of the year, which is a nice little YouTube compilation. So I'll put that in the show notes and you can just enjoy some beautiful, soft looking deep sea things that maybe you can consider cuddling. Or maybe that's just me. So I think the other thing we need to talk about, I think we need to have a hard reset on the Mariana snowfish, Tom. I didn't know it was glitching. Do we need a restart? It's glitching. It's a hard reset. It's the type of hard reset where you need to hold a button down for 10 seconds with a pin. It's one of those emergency ones where you have to scramble around looking for something small enough to get in there to stop it. Is it the bad PC turn off? The turn off at the wall? The one where it goes, do you? Yeah. Yeah, they don't like that. What's wrong with it? I thought it was fine. <laughs> <sighs> to be honest, the man on snowfish is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it is what it is. It's got a name now. You know what I mean? It's living its new life as Sudal de Paris. It's just as an imposter out there. Is the media maybe favouring a more glamorous, more beautiful representative? I think so. And I think I'm also responsible for the imposter. <laughs> you saw something beautiful and you've ruined it. Yeah, so I think, we should, I think we should talk about this. But we're not having a go at anybody in particular. It's just one of those interesting things where one particular image seems to overshadow. If it's anyone's fault, it's Google's. Because it is one of the first hits if you search for Hadel Snailfish on Mario Starfish. I think I think it's actually it's our fault. We've obviously done the public a bad service by not really explaining stuff because we're technically responsible for both characters involved in this. <laughs> but no one seems to be able to get it right. Before we be any more cryptic, let's just get on with this. In 2018, there was an artist called Roger and he painted a mural inside of the Falcor, which is the Schmidt Ocean Institute vessel. Great big mural showing two lovely big Hadel snailfish, Mariana snailfish they were, because they thought that was one of the big discoveries we made on Falco, which was Tom and I. We did, you know, you and I went out, we discovered the Mariana snailfish. Unfortunately, it's the wrong fish. <laughs> <laughs> now, it would have been nice to have known they were doing that, because if we had just even had a wee phone call with a guy, we could have said, uh, those fish have got nothing to do with Mariana Trench or Falco, for that matter. The imposter fish is also the one which the Chinese are using as an inspiration for their soft robotics vehicle. So they keep putting this, this beautiful little bit of tech they're developing. And I actually shared a virtual stage with a guy who did it in China recently. And it's some really, really cool stuff. But they're keeping it alongside this picture of the Mariana snailfish. And that's not the Mariana snailfish. And Blue Planet 2 brought out this infographic a poster that was in lots of schools and stuff like that. And the deepest fish in the world is the Mariana snailfish. And there's this little picture of this fish. And that's not the Mariana snailfish. <laughs> and it keeps going on. So there was an article in Nautilus magazine came out last summer. And I'm in there like banging away about whatever it was I was talking about. Uh, and under the bit that I'm talking about has a picture of the Mariana snailfish and a little caption underneath it saying the Mariana snailfish and that's not the Mariana snailfish at all. It was credited to Schmidt which it wasn't either. Uh, and more recently we have to both simultaneously tip our trilbies to somebody called... But let's just say a listener because we haven't cleared that we can oust them. <laughs> Alright, to one of our fans of the podcast who recently let us know through the powers of the interwebs that they had this beautiful Mariana snailfish tattoo done. And, yeah, do you, do, you, do you want to say these words out loud, Tom, or do you want me to... I want you to do it. Although, I will, I will also chime in that I'm immensely flattered, and it's named after me. It's called Thomas. Yeah, it's not the Mariana Snailfish, though, is it? <laughs> it's not, but it's still beautiful. <laughs> it is still a Hadel Snailfish. It is lovely, and we're not taking the mic. It's just one of those things, it's just amazing. The, the Snailfish, which is being the imposter, or the one, <laughs> the one that everyone's using, uh, is one that I've 
photographed about four or five years before we ever went to Mariana Trench, and it's what we're unofficially calling the Atacama snailfish. It's never been caught. So it's, it's, for some reason, it's just been adopted as the deepest fish in the world when it's not. Officially, we're now calling it Laparid SP in debt 3 hyphen PCT. I was going to ask you for this official designation. It's the official designation, and it was mm-hmm. officially photographed at 7,049 metres deep in the Atacama Trench of Chile on the 10th of September 2010 on the German ship Zona, some 16,222 kilometres away from the nearest Mariana snailfish and 1,200 metres shallower. It's still an amazing it's fish. Mad. It's a famous little fish, but for some reason... It's just more photogenic. It's, it's a really pretty image. It is more photogenic. For the person with the tattoo, we'll send you some cool stuff relating to that particular fish and we'll make a better story than ever being the Mariana snailfish. I'll even send them the original photograph. Okay, that'll that'll be our thank you. Nothing's original in the digital age, though, is it? Well, it's not the one that's online because it's the proper uncropped, undoctored version. Yes. It is the raw data of your tattoo inspiration. The raw inspiration. data from that particular one. But it is odd. You don't think it is really weird how it's just a case of now you just Google something and it comes up and my eye snowfish and they just accept it. And I don't know how we undo that now. It's, it's just, so. I, mean, in... I guess to the untrained eye, maybe it just looks the same. But it's just, It just it, looks a prettier version. On one of those websites as well, I had a big video of one of the things we did on the Falco job and underneath it, it was talking but this is the Mariana snowfish. Like, no, that's not it either. <laughs> that's the third one. That's not it either. And it was talking about how it's some ghost fish, and it's like it was never called a ghost fish, was it? You know, it's just I, I don't know. I don't know what it's, it's our fault, Tom. We're doing something wrong. We're obviously not explaining this very well. But there are different types of fish in the sea, and they all sometimes look similar, but they're not. I'm sure every aspect of science is like this because you get to that species level resolution and there's probably only a few experts in the world who can tell them apart. Yeah. For the majority, it's probably enough. But yeah, we're super approachable. Like, get in touch with us on Twitter or through the podcast feed if you want anything sort of fact-checked or to... Or, yeah. I've just thought of something even better. I could roll up my sleeves and get my tattoo hat back on again and I'll go and doctor it and make it a Mariana snowfish. Or, or add to it. It could just be a, a whole yeah. Heidel snowfish piece. I forget that you're an experienced tattoo artist. <laughs> yeah, having done so many tattoos in my life, I could probably just go there and just sort it out. And it would be taxonomically correct as well, right? Because I'll come along with you and we'll, we'll get the right number of thin rays. We'll go super pedantic over it. Hmm. We'll put a scale bar on as well. Reviewers always want a scale bar, so we'll add that. <laughs> we do need to catch that one, though, because the one that's getting all the glory doesn't have a name. We can't keep calling it the Leparid SPT, whatever it was, in debt. Flipping three hyphen PCT. Oh, it sounds like a sports car. It sounds great. No, I'd drive that. It sounds more like an engine part. <laughs> yeah, it's the bit that's broken. You need a new one. <laughs> yeah, it's just a serial number. <laughs> uh, or a, a gaming monitor. They've all got crazy names. Uh, it's worth actually mentioning we didn't talk about the big, huge fish paper because we didn't want to toot our own horns too much. But that was huge. That was multi years of work and the culmination of a lot of expeditions. I think we sort of compiled everything up until a couple of years ago and the last couple of years have done so much that it was kind of half all new half pulling together a lot of records and but yeah loads loads of new sightings and loads of like frustratingly tantalizing new sightings because there's things that are clearly new species probably new genera and yeah we've only got images of them so until we get a specimen we can't name them properly so that's why they get catchy little names. But there's a funny story in there, because uh, one of the things about deep sea fish and deep fish, the point of the paper is it doesn't really matter what the deepest fish in the world is, what matters is how deep they go, depending on where they are in different places in the world, you know, it's, and so on and so on. But there's always been this thing about the abyssal brochula galathea that was supposedly of caught at 8,370, whatever it was, metres in Puerto Rico, and it's a fish we just can't find. It just doesn't seem to be there. It's, it seems a bit spurious. It was taken at a time where there was no closing nets or any real pressure sensor and so on and so on. And it's always been a bit of a thorn in a site because no matter what we do someone's like oh but technically there was so much of the colour three years deeper and it's like actually I don't really care because we've been there now we've done tons of work it just ain't there anyway I put that paper in for review and the comments came back and there's a bit in there somewhere or was or maybe still is discussing this fabled abyssal brochure of Calathea and the reviewer said uh do you know you found it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you look at figure, whatever it was, thinking about that's as pretty close as you'll ever get to a photograph of what looks a lot like a bristle brochula. It might not be as deep as you thought, it's like 6,500 or something, but I'm pretty sure that's a brochula in the Puerto Rico trench at Hill that's And you've been so sort of focused on the deeper whether end. it's at the actual deepest point or not, you've actually filmed it and didn't see it. There is a lot going on in that paper. The jelly nose ones are cool. They were like four or 5,000 metres deep in the next known species in that family. And they were in two trenches. And it's nice to see them alive because they're quite, you know, that jelly nose is quite damaged by trawling. So it's lovely to see them like mooching around. When you watch the video, they don't look particularly smart. I know a lot lot of fish don't look particularly intelligent, I must admit, certainly deep ones, but the jelly noses do look a bit stupid. 
the brain is an energetically expensive organ and a lot of deep sea stuff uh, shaves a little bit off that to save on energy budget. Yeah. The bony eared ass fish is the current record for smallest brain to body ratio, which makes oh. it super, super efficient and dumb as a brick. There's something else we haven't mentioned yet, Tom. Go on. Our podcast is in the top 5% podcast of all time. It, it does appear so. We are now in the top 5%. Have you ever been in the top 5% of anything? Not Nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to interpret some of these internet analytical tools, but... A lot of podcasts, like, exist for one episode and then disappear. But that's still... That's very cool. But does it not filter that out? Is there not a way of, like, showing ones which have a sort of legacy? I'll look into that. I mean, it means the feeds are active. It means they're still sort of... Oh, yeah, I suppose they're really not, is it? And there's some podcasts that have, like, a year hiatus and then come back. There's a few that came back in lockdown that people decided to pick up as a project. It's just a bigger gap between episodes rather than it really being done. Let's not talk ourselves down here. We're in the top 5% of podcasts in all time, so... You yeah, know. I can feel the, the waves of anxiety washing over me like a beautiful tropical beach. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, well done us. Congratulations. Happy New Year. Thanks. The whole world's going to die anyway. Sorry about Party. that paper. What, the sea's going to boil? It's not. It's just going to flow the wrong way. And then that's going to mess some things up. To try and distract from that, let's have a little bit of art. So someone I've recently come to know has written a poem about a blobfish. So without further ado, here they are. I'm Prema Arasu, a researcher and writer at the University of Western Australia, and this is an ode to the blobfish. O Cyclus Mycidas, O gelatinous shape, thou art the ravished bride of deep sea trawlers, unassuming foster child of the timeless abyss, untimely ripped from thy diatomaceous womb. Fearful fishermen rejoice at thy sacrifice, an antipodean altar attended by inchoate priests, then once by man and angels to be seen. In roaring thou shalt rise and on the surface die. Were I anointed and dragged to thy hadal habitus, flayed and deconsecrated at thy mucilaginous prow, were I to partake in salted communion with thou, we would be one and the same. Hideousness is a lie, lies hideousness, that is all we know on land, and all we need to know. Today's guest, before we get there, I haven't got a long and winding road. Yeah, so last episode, the Christmas episode, I mentioned Frank Zappa. So this story starts with Frank Zappa. And back in the day, I used to listen to a lot of Frank Zappa. And he used to have this song. It was a kind of parody on the American redneck called Lonesome Cowboy Bert. This is when I was at university, long before I ever had any interest in marine biology at all. And one of the live albums had an alternative version of that. And it was called Lonesome Cowboy Nando. And it was about this marine biologist who was into jellyfish and so on. It was quite a funny song. It's a bit silly. Anyway, fast forward maybe 10 years. And I'm giving a talk at the Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh and there's four of us on the stage and a sort of panel Q&A thing. The third person was this guy called Fernando Boreo and he's an Italian guy, he's a jellyfish taxonomist, really, really interesting guy. And afterwards we went from dinner or buffet, whatever it was, and I got talking to him. It transpires that he is actually Lonesome Cowboy Nando from the Zappa song. So I'm like, what on earth, what, what's the story there? And it turned out in the 80s he was describing jellyfish and Zappa was his favourite artist so he wrote to Frank Zappa and says I've got this new species of jellyfish and I want to name it Zappa Eye is that okay? And apparently Frank Zappa said yeah sure but as long as you come to my house in California for a couple of weeks and just hang out and apparently he was just intrigued by the fact that there's people in this world who spend their days describing jellyfish and they became good friends and it was a big long story about that but Fernando himself, let's just call him Nando, he's a really really fascinating guy and he's written a whole manner of really sort of interesting thought provoking sometimes aggressive, sometimes quite <laughs> ranty papers about various things, normally centred around taxonomy one way or another, because he's a taxonomist. You know, we got on really well, we stayed in touch, and he started sending me all these papers, some of which he had written, some of which were on the same lines, but other people had written. And he had some really interesting points, which is kind of relevant to what we're talking about today to some respect, and it's about the difference between natural history and ecology. So what he's discussing in some of his work is that natural history is based on observations, whereas modern ecology is mostly based on experiments aimed at hypotheses, testing and things like that. And there's an interesting line in one of his papers that says, simply describing what we see is no longer considered to be scientific nowadays, and descriptive science has now become a derogatory term. Right? So then he argues that hypotheses-driven experiments often reveal generalities that are taken as norms, but ecology and evolution are a history which is driven by both regularities and irregularities. And what he's saying is when you do sort of normal statistical-based 
ecology, you tend to look for the norm. You're not looking at the weird stuff, the unexpected stuff, the irregularities, but they still exist. So by not including that, you're kind of almost excluding natural history from what is ultimately considered to be natural history, if you know what I mean. If all ecological rules were then followed, unexpected things shouldn't happen, and that's not the case. So what he's arguing is that discarding of importance of anecdotes and irregularities is preventing us from understanding the real deep sea. And he thinks that any event where you have an expert eye such as you and I, Tom, we see something we go, ooh, what's that? We might judge that as potentially important and it's worth being reported. And it's almost like the underappreciation of importance in natural history can be, lead to the underreporting of rare but important events. And this comes down to some of the papers we write. In my career, certainly, we've done a combination of interesting high-profile stuff that you know includes not a lot of data. And we've done high-profile stuff that includes a lot of data. And there's some big, long papers and not a lot. And the short papers, we have loads in. But it's actually the ones that lean more towards the natural history that Nando was talking about that I have probably the most fondness for and that the ones that makes me stay enthusiastic about this job. And examples of that are things like, you know, really simple ones like the first time we ever filmed a fish deeper than 6,000 metres. You know, that's one data point. It's not a huge big thing. It's not going to change the world in terms of ecology, but it's an interesting little observation that was worthy of recording. And think other things like, like the supergiant, for example, and so on. So more recently, we had the octopus incident whereby... We put cameras down and we normally have a reasonable idea of what we're going to see, even at 7,000 metres. And all of a sudden, a Dumbo octopus turns up and that Dumbo octopus was about 2,000 metres deeper than we would expect it to be. So that was quite a big deal. And that was the first time I ever picked up the squid phone to Mike Vecchioni, the lord of the squid, because... Even now, I still kind of doubt myself because, you know, in my mind, I think it would be really cool just to write a paper that says, oh, by the way, octopus or even the entire order of cephalopods go way deeper than we think we did. I actually opened my email to him and said, this is what we found. Should we just keep this in a general biodiversity paper about a particular deep part of the Indian Ocean? Or does this warrant its own paper? And what was cool is Mike just came straight back and went, nah, put that in its own paper. So we, so we ended up writing the deepest octopus paper, which was, was really cool. And it was really good to work with this guy because he obviously knows his stuff. And that was that. And I think towards the end of that conversation surrounding the paper, once it had been published, I joked to him and said, uh, you need to find the deepest squid next. <laughs> Within a year, as reported on this very podcast live from the field, lo and behold, we filmed a squid at 6,200 metres, which again puts something like 1,500 metres on all squid. And it wasn't me who phoned the squid phone that time, believe it or not. It was Mike phoned the squid phone on me. Because he heard about the squid on the podcast. And he was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So then we got together and we wrote part two of the deepest cephalopod studies. And that's just been published. So I, I really like those really short, snappy little papers that say, we thought all of this. And here's just an example of one of those irregularities. One of those things that you would never find in one of these big, heavy statistical analyses of whatever it may be. And I make no apologies for that. I, I really like that. So as we're going through the podcast, certainly over the last few months, whenever we're talking deep sea news, it always seems there's a story about some sort of squid. Can you remind me here, Tom, of all the ones we've had? The ram's horn squid? That was one, wasn't it? Lots of misreporting, lots of like, oh, it's a monster. And then Mike turning up and going like, no, we, we know what that is. Yeah, there was a proper back flying squid, wasn't it? And then there was the, the vampire squid, the fossils, or something, the vampire squid. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I've been around a lot longer. All those squid reports are interesting because they are the epitome of those observations of natural history, which Nando was basically saying that form a collective gold mine of facts. They may not be ultra amazingly robust data sets, but they are part of this job, which I find one of the most appealing. It's just that curveball when you're out doing your stuff and you're counting this out the next thing, you're filming that the next thing, and then someone just pops up and goes, "Woo, there you go. Squid stuff seems to capture a lot of people's imagination as well. Of all the animals we've covered in the deep sea news, squid do seem to be right up there. So there's something about it. So as promised on the Christmas episode, I think it's time that the podcast return the call to the squid phone and we hear all about it from the Lord of the Squid. And from Washington, D.C. today, we are joined by Mike Vecchioni. Thanks for doing this, Mike. Oh, I'm happy to do it. I think it's long overdue. I, I actually really enjoy the podcast, too. So. Oh, thanks. So so you know that we're a highly professional... Uh, it's a very slick operation. I, I have heard some laughter uh, during the podcast. <gasps> <laughs> no, surely not. I think that's just feedback. That's a bit of electrical feedback. It often sounds like laughter. So first question is the most important question. Do you have an actual squid phone on your desk? And I'm picturing a squid-shaped phone 
that when it's called, it has tentacles that vibrate and eyes that rotate when scientists and the media call you up for a sound bite about squid? No, I'd like to have one of those. Oh, we should get you I, one of those. I did used to have a cover on my cell phone that had a, it looked like a squid eating a sperm whale, which of course is backwards, but very spectacular. <laughs> First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself for the benefit of the audience. Okay, well, I am the squid guy at the Smithsonian, which sounds like I work for the Smithsonian Institution, but I actually work for NOAA, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they pay me to work at the Natural History Museum in Washington, where I am the curator of cephalopods, which includes squids and octopods and other weird kinds of things, and also of pteropods, which are swimming snails, which are also strange, and I really like strange things. What's your favorite out of those three? Oh, squids. I, I've always liked squids. So I think we should put down the rules of engagement because of everything we've talked about in the last few months about squid. We have to acknowledge that Mike does know about other animals. <laughs> but for the, for the purpose of this episode, we're going to stick to the squid. Okay. Which brings me to my next question, right? And this is something that I actually meant to ask you this, but I didn't want to because I was too embarrassed in case I came across it sounding a bit stupid. But the word squid, is that actually a valid term? Or is it just one of those lazy names... And what is the actual real taxonomic name for squid? It's one of those lazy names. There's lots of things that are called squids. And even the squid scientists can't seem to agree on, on what's a squid and what's not a squid. So as far as I'm concerned, squids refer to the oceanic squids or the members of the egopsida, as, as it's called. And maybe the coastal squids, which are myopsids and include things like Lalago and Dory Toothis, which are really important commercial species. All of those are kind of squid looking. They have a long body that shapes sort of like a fish's body, but it's got uh, fins at one end and it's got uh, an arm crown at the, the other end, which consists of eight arms and two modified arms that we call tentacles. When you break down squid, it is like subdivisions. I'm right in saying there are decapoda forms, right? There are decapodiforms, which is a, a group of cephalopods, but not all decapodiforms are squids. Uh, there are other groups. Yeah, this is what I was going to say, because I'm there. right in saying that the cuttlefish are in there with the squid, but then the vampire squids sit alongside the octopus, but are not either. Is that right? That's right. There's also a group called bobtails, which some people think of as cuttlefish, but some people call them stubby squids. It turns out they're not very closely related to what I just said was squids, the, uh, the oceanic and, and coastal squid groups. And then there's the vampire squid, which is actually more closely related to octopods, but it got the name vampire squid a long time ago, and it's kind of stuck. <laughs> is that all it is? It's just the fact that these names have just stuck and you know is there anything you can do about that is it a, a big push for trying to resolve all this or is it just a case of ah, that's what they're called now so well every time i talk on something like this podcast i uh, i try to set the record straight but it doesn't seem to work <laughs> well you come to the right place now you know you've been on the deep sea podcast i'm sure it will change the world i'm looking forward to it yeah so obviously squid are massively diverse. I mean, they're, they're a really fascinating group. I mean, think about like the pygmy squid and the dumbos and the big fins and the colossals and all that kind of stuff. Is there a particular one that you find fascinating? Because we've all got our favorite kids, right? Yeah, but we're not supposed to. No, I know. But you, let's face it, we do. So <laughs> of all the squid, which, which is the one you go to? Probably the, the big fin squid. It was a uh, an unknown up until just before 2000, uh, we, we uh, described a new family based on some babies. And then we finally got some videos of the, the grown-ups. And so around the change of the century, we started finding out about these really big and charismatic squids that live in the deep sea. And uh, a friend of mine from the University of Hawaii, Dick Young, and I described a new family based on all that. And now it, we're finding more and more records and we're finding more and more reasons that they're remarkable. So that's my favorite. So for the benefit of the audience, those are the ones that I think Tom was talking about them before. They're, it's also the ones that we were talking about. We've just found the deepest one. That was a little juvenile one. But you know that classic image where you see the squid hanging midwar and it just has these absolutely ridiculously long arms. It's That's the one that what, really creeps people out. Yeah. It's the way it's so motionless, right? Yeah, they, they sort of drift along and they've got... As I said before, the squids have eight arms and two tentacles, but on the big fin squid, you can't tell them apart because they're all the same and they all have an elbow in the arm. And then from the elbow on out, it's a really long, skinny, spaghetti-like extension, which has microscopic suckers on it. And as they drift along, they have their arms spread out and then these spaghetti-like extensions sort of hanging down from the elbows. 
and they're drifting along with these 10 pieces of spaghetti hanging underneath them, waiting for something to bump into them and, and stick to them. On top of that, they have this huge fin, which is where they get their name. So they're very bizarre looking and they get really big. Well, I say big. Big refers to the total length of the animal, including these ridiculous spaghetti-like extensions. The biggest one that I'm aware of so far was a estimated to be about 21 feet long, less than seven meters long. But uh, the body length on that was probably about a foot, a third of a meter. So how does it feed then? Like almost filtering, if it's assuming something comes in and swims within its arms. So does it grab it and then pull it up to its mouth? What a good question. We we don't know. Because it doesn't look like that would work particularly gracefully. Those extensions are not very muscular. Yeah. But we do know that with the microscopic suckers on them, they're very sticky because on occasion the submersible videos have shown one bumping into a piece of the submersible and then the squid flaps its fins to try to get away and it can't seem to let go. It seems like when something sticks to it, it, it doesn't release very easily. But how it gets a piece of food from a long way away from its mouth stuck to one of these spaghetti-like things up to its mouth. We don't know. 20 feet away. So I'm I'm hoping that one of these submersible observations will show me how it does that. Is there still a a beak up there? Yeah, it does. It's Anatomically, it's it's like other oceanic squid. So yeah, it does have a a beak. It has to have a a beak because on cephalopods, the esophagus goes through the center of the brain. So they have to bite their food into little pieces or else they get a terrible headache. (laughs) So on the subject of large squid, we're going to have to talk about giant and colossal squid. Yeah, everybody wants to do that. (laughs) Yeah. But of the ones I've seen in museums, I I must admit I'm almost slightly disappointed. Because I think when you you see these little infographics in newspapers and stuff like that, they always make them out to be absolutely massive. And then you get to see it and you realize it's not massive, it's kind of just long. Is there actually a reasonably good estimate of how big they truly get? Well, for a giant squid, which... When I say giant squid, I'm talking about the genus Architeuthis yeah. in the family Architeuthidae. But uh, for a giant squid, most of the length is in the arms and tentacles, but they're still pretty big. The mantle length gets bigger than me, so I consider that to be a big squid. And then add to that the head and the arms and, and so on. And they get they get really big uh, in terms of length, but there's a controversy about how big they get. The early scientific reports, which were in the late 1800s, reported a specimen that was something like 48 feet long. But since then, nobody's seen one that big. So there was a guy in New Zealand named Steve O'Shea who uh, was working on both giant squids, the Architeuthis, and another species that gets really big, which he named the Colossal Squid because he thought it was bigger than giant squids. And uh, Steve said that uh, since nobody's seen one that big since the 1800s, and we don't have a museum specimen from those early reports, that he didn't think that giant squids got that big, but that uh, these uh, colossal squids get really big too. And so it became a, my squid's bigger than your squid kind of argument. (laughs) I just found it interesting how the, the giant squid maintained its sort of fame based on how long it's sort of been known about and just how catchy that name is. Whereas the Colossal, it sort of seemed to supersede it in terms of being much more muscular, much more, it's got the hooks, it's, it seems a more aggressive predator, but it's the giant one that sticks in people's minds. They're probably both aggressive predators, which is normal for a squid. The hooks certainly look scary to a human, although I don't think any human would ever have to worry about either one of these species. The colossal squids don't get as long as the giant squids, but they have a bigger body mass to length ratio. So they probably get more massive than a giant squid, although not as long as a giant squid. But what really has kept giant squids in the popular imagination is Jules Verne, because he started out the idea that these are, are sea monsters. And of course, people love the idea of sea monsters. I'm sure you guys get that a lot. Um, Jules Verne based his attack of the giant squid on an an actual account where a French ship had uh, encountered a giant squid at the surface and had tried to haul it aboard and couldn't. (laughs) He turned that into an attack on the sub, but it's not something that anybody would ever have to worry about because they live really, really deep. But we find them floating at the surface every once in a while because sperm whales feed on them. And sperm whales are really sloppy feeders. So it's not unusual to see dead squids at the surface 
in areas where sperm whales are feeding. I always find that quite surprising. Certainly when you're at sea and you're at night and you put the, the light into the sea and all the squid come along, you get a feel for just how fast normal squid, I'm not talking about giants here, but just normal squid, how fast they are and how maneuverable they are. It's just insane. And then you think of something as big as a sperm whale going for a giant squid. I would all just assume the giant squid could easily outmaneuver it, but apparently not, obviously not, because they keep finding beaks in their guts. So I, I, I would put my money on the giant squid getting away. Well, like you said, we, we know that the sperm whales are successful, and that's one of the things they focus on, not just Archidathus, but any large squid generally deep in the water. Uh, they're good at it, and we know they hunt by making really loud noises. One thought is that the clicking, the, the really rapid, loud clicking that sperm whales do as they're approaching their prey might somehow incapacitate the giant squids. Oh, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. See, that, that would explain it, right? Because you just figured a squid with it, the first sign of trouble will just immediately turn and run. You would think so, yeah. And, you know, the idea behind why they have the largest eyes that we know about in living things anyway uh, is so that they can see stimulated bioluminescence by a sperm whale that's that's coming at them indicates that they want to see it and run away as soon as possible. Uh, obviously, the sperm whales are good at it. So it's interesting you mentioned like Jules Verne and stuff like that. And uh, I think one of my things I'm interested in at the moment is to do with human perception of, of some of these animals, in particular deep sea. And then what is it about the squid that really gets people's attention? I mean, just the sheer number of news stories, it seems that whenever somebody films a squid, they're immediately on the news because people will click on that. And it's weird because it's a body form that we shouldn't like. You know, humans don't like things like spiders because we can't relate to ourselves. It doesn't have a face you can look at. And we don't like snakes because they move in a way which is quite far removed from ourselves. And you look at the squid and it is equally as bizarre. But at the same time, kids have cuddly toys of squids, right? You know, we, we've kind of... Yeah, squids are beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but they shouldn't be. They should be the stuff of nightmares, right? They're such a weird animal. Yeah, they're 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 way weirder than a lot of insects are. But you know, we don't put them in the same pigeonhole. So there's something really quite unique about the squid in that they shouldn't be loved the way they are, but they totally are. Yeah, squids and octopus also. Yeah, they're so bizarre, but they're also relatable because of their eyes and because of their intelligence and the fact that they are both weird looking and relatable, I think that that puts them into this alien category that really fascinates a lot of people. Like a friendly alien though. Yeah. A cuddly one. Yeah. You know, some of them are thought of as friendly aliens, like my octopus teacher a special that was on Netflix, I think. But like we were saying, some of them are thought of as not being so friendly, like the Kraken that pulls down the sailing yeah. ship and eats everybody. So they have all these different aspects, but people love them. Every time anybody finds out that I work on cephalopods, their ears pick up and they of course the first thing they ask me about is giant squids. I'm all about the Dumbo now after last year's find, but I actually used that. I recently did a TEDx talk, and one of the things I, I asked was, you know, picture in your mind what the deepest octopus in the world looks like. And you can sort of see people going, oh, my God, you know, this is going to be horrendous. Almost like brace yourself for this. Brace yourself, everyone. <laughs> this is the deepest octopus in the world. And then it just showed a video of this beautiful little Dumbo just Dumboing around. Yeah, cute. And it's like this. <laughs> yeah, and everyone goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's, just, it's the size of a puppy. And it's like, this thing is thousands and thousands of meters on the water. And there it is, just like, da, 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 just running around the seafloor being an octopus. I love that. I think yeah. there's so many examples of the deepest blah, blah, blah just being ridiculously not frightening at all. Yeah, I got to say that one thing that's stoked that kind of interest has been uh, the in situ observations from submersibles and drop cameras and stuff like that. Because until we started seeing what they really looked like, then I don't think they had a particularly the deep sea stuff, didn't have as much interest to people. Well, there was less to relate to because I think a lot of these, you know, historically you'd go to the Natural History Museum or the Smithsonian or whatever and you go to look to the deep sea section and you see this pickled fish or octopus and formalin with its skin all peeled back and it's sort of slightly deflated and, it, you know, it looks horrid. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that doesn't resemble how they look in life at all. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, you just spoke about this before, but the classic one is the blobfish, that photograph going around. Yeah, it's a terrible picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not what a blobfish looks like. Yeah. But... yeah, another one's a goblin shark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's freaky when it's dead. Yeah, but it just looks like a shark when it's swimming around. Yeah, it's just got a big nose. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the other thing that we like to talk about on this is throughout your career, you obviously come across various bits of research or observation and they get either published in scientific journals or hit the media, whatever it is. But falling through the cracks of science and media, what's the weirdest squid-related story that's happened in your career that you've never told anyone? Oh. Oh, that's a good, oh, that means <laughs> I'd have to think about that for a while because I don't not tell people things. <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, either it winds up as a, a publication in the scientific literature or a blog post for a dive record or something like that. So, I mean, there's still a lot of mysteries that we haven't figured out yet. So what, what is the next big thing? What is the big thing in squid research that's lacking? This is not actually an answer to your question, but, you know, people ask me when we first discovered the big fin squid, am I going to start an expedition to go find one? I've heard the same thing about uh, giant squids. People have beat their head against the giant squid question for years. I think that our technology is not good enough yet to focus on these. If I had to design an expedition to explore a question like, how does a big fin squid get the food from its, its arm extensions up to its mouth? You could waste a lot of time and money uh, on it that. It would not be a useful use of uh, scientific funding to put a, an expedition to do that. It'll be uncovered incidentally as people are exploring the deep sea. What I'm in favor of is broad concept exploration of the deep sea and see what we see. We don't know what we don't know yet. We've just been talking about that, but there's a sort of difference between like hypotheses-driven ecology versus observational, descriptive natural history. Right. And But before you can really do hypothesis-driven ecology, you've got to know the system pretty well yeah. in order to come up with reasonable hypotheses that can be tested. And in the deep sea, we're still at the exploratory stage. I think the deeper you go, the more you end up just there's a thing. There's a thing. <laughs> right. There's a yeah. thing. I mean, in terms of controlled experiments, they're still hundreds of years away. Yeah. And, and when you see there's a thing, then you've got to find the person that would know the most about that thing to tell you how interesting it is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the question from my 10-year-old son, Matthew, so he's quite big in the squid Good. and deep sea animals generally. Uh, that's not my doing either. He seems blissfully unimpressed that I've just published a paper on the deepest squid in the world, which is quite heartbreaking. But but he's very excited that I'm talking to you. So his question is, how does it make the ink and how long does it take to refill its ink sac after it's inked? Those are two really good questions. It's got a gland where it, it secretes melanin, which is just a really dark chemical. And that gland secretes the melanin into an ink sac where it's mixed with mucus. And then when it gets upset about something and it wants to put out ink, it actually squirts from that ink sac into its intestine and goes out with the digestive waste out through the end of the intestine, and which actually goes out into the body of the squid. It mixes with water there and then goes out through the funnel because that's how squids breathe and also how they swim with jet propulsion. And so it can produce different kinds of consistencies of the ink based on different uses. So one thing that it can do is make a what's called a pseudomorph, the same size and shape as the squid. And a squid can produce one of these pseudomorphs. And before it does that, it'll turn its whole body dark by expanding all its chromatophores. And then it will jet away, but leave this blob of dark ink that's the same size and shape as the squid behind. And at the same time it jets away, it contracts all this chromatophore. So the whole body, instead of being really dark, becomes sort of transparent. And so a predator going for that dark squid will instead go for the pseudomorph left behind by the squid while it swims away. That's one way that it uses the ink. And another way is it can also mix it with a whole lot more water and mucus and, and form a cloud. And we're finding out more and more that oceanic squids will make a cloud and then they'll come back and hide in that cloud. They'll, they'll actually go into the cloud and, and go motionless in it, which is sort of like when an octopus produces what people refer to as a smoke screen. It's like climbing into your own shadow. The other part of the question was, how long does it take to refill? And it's really hard to get a cephalopod to run out of ink. They've done experiments with cuttlefish where they just bothered them over and over again. And the cuttlefish will ink over and over and over again. It's really difficult to get it to run out of ink. It doesn't take very much of that ink to make a blob of ink. Oh, well, okay. I'll tell him that. He'll be happy. All right. To finish up, we've already got the deepest octopus now, or we think, and the deepest squid. What's the deepest cuttlefish? Where can I go find that? Well, Falcor just saw some. The research vessel was diving with its sub, Sebastian, in the Coral Sea, and they saw some at almost 700 meters down. There are reports of 
around that depth, maybe as much as a thousand meters, but they have a problem because they've got a gas filled cuddle bone. If they go too deep, the gas will compress and the cuddle bone will implode. As far as depth records, I really trust the submersible records much more than the trawling records for depth. So I'm guessing somewhere around seven, 800 meters might be as deep as a, a cuttlefish can go. And it depends on the species of cuttlefish. Brilliant. Fascinating stuff. Tom, you get anything you want to bring into this? If Mike feels anything is sort of missed by the general public, if there's any massive misconceptions that drive him mad, anything that he feels more people need to know about. <laughs> what drives me mad is when I've uh, tried to set something straight and I keep running into the same misconception <laughs> over and over again. I think that's just deep sea in general. Yeah, that feels familiar. <laughs> but but I actually, I've thought of an answer to your previous question about what I would like to see from the deep sea. One thing that really raises my curiosity is on these uh, ram's horn squids that the spirula that have an internal chambered shell. They're often found around islands and places like that. So we are guessing that they lay their eggs on the bottom, but we actually don't know that. Uh, we have no idea how ram's horn squid lays its eggs, whether it holds its egg masses in its arms like we were surprised to find some squids do, or whether it deposits its eggs on the bottom in what we call bathyal depths around islands and around the edges of continents. And I would like really like to know more about the in situ biology of those ram's horn squids. When someone says something like that, I just keep going into how you would do it. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> again, I don't think you could difficult, isn't it? plan an expedition to answer that question. I, I think. I think you just have to wait until somebody stumbles yeah, across somebody it. Will We'll find it accidentally. A lot of the interesting squid sightings are coming from oil and gas industry as well, aren't they? Because there's just the number of ROVs in the water. And yeah, the first sighting of an, an adult big fin squid came from the oil and gas industry. Did it? Yeah. It's an incredible resource that just the sheer number of hours they're filming in deep water. Oh, yeah. And every industry ROV pilot you talk to will, will whip out the thumb drive and be like, these are my best bits. These are my weird things. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. It was great. There were things like the Serpent Project that tapped into that, yeah. linked them up with scientists because they, they've all got their greatest hits. They've all got the, the weird thing they saw. Yeah, I, I've gotten a lot of good observations from the Serpent Project. Wonderful. My favorite take home from all that is thinking about a giant squid being incapacitated by a sonic head ray from a sperm whale. Possibly. You know, that's speculation. No, no, no. It's real. It, no, yeah. no, no, no. It's yeah. fact now. It's fact now. That's <laughs> now definitely a thing. It's probably got laser sights as well. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Mike. That's absolutely fascinating. Well, I'm glad you asked me. No, it's been a long time coming. I think we, we should have had you on before. And we'll do a part two at some point in the future when we'll get to talk about octopus. Discover something else that I can play with and then we can talk about it. Well, I was going to go for the deepest cuttlefish, but if it's only 700 meters then. Yeah, I I'm pretty sure it's less than a thousand. We don't get a bed for 4,000. It's still deep yeah. sea though. It's more than 200. Nah, it's not. It's not deep sea unless it's 5,000 meters. Oh, well, it's funny you mentioned that because when I, <laughs> when I started doing the deep sea work, I thought anything deeper than 200 was really interesting. And now I think if it's less than 1,000, it's sort of boring. I thought 1,000 meters was a good mark because you're beyond the influence of sunlight. And a lot of the stuff that happens and a lot of the adaptations you see are direct results of diminished light levels. And that probably explains more of what's going on there than depth does per se. It's more to do with, with light. But beyond a thousand meters, you're down to more of a similar environment. I've been doing a lot of work in the Gulf of Mexico and before that on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, looking at the mesopelagic, which is between 200 and a thousand general, and the bathypelagic, which is deeper than a thousand. And I used to think of them as being completely separate, basically a floorboards in between them. And it turns out there's a lot more bleed over between the two depth ranges than I originally thought of. Uh, a thousand is a good justifiable changeover, but it's not as hard and fast as I would like it to be. <laughs> but at the same time, these, these are all just imaginary lines that we draw to make our terminology more convenient, right? Ultimately, there is no line anywhere. 200 meters seems awfully shallow. It's the edge of the shelf break. It's the bottom of the epipelagic, the euphotic zone, where there's enough sunlight for photosynthesis. It's also this changeover between the, the seasonal mixing and the permanent thermocline. So that there's a lot of reason for 200 meters. I just think what happens at 201 meters bears no resemblance to what happens at 10,900 meters. But they're all collectively known as the deep sea. I think some of the... Not damage, but some of the, the bad reputation the deep sea has in terms of how much generally people care about it is, is when you draw that line and you say, this is sea, this is deep sea. 
it's almost you saying this is the bit which is useful and valuable to us and this is the bit that we don't care about yeah <laughs> and it's and it's actually scientists who have drawn that line have called the top half of the water good sea yeah. and the bottom half of the water bad sea for a lot of public the the deep sea is when you're out of sight of land yeah that's another one I hear quite a lot as well, yeah. I would call it open ocean. Right. We've already talked today that the, the word squid doesn't mean anything anyway, so terminology. Huh? Squid don't even exist. All right, Mike, thanks very much. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Again, I appreciate the uh, interest. So fantastic to hear from Mike. You're a little bit starstruck sometimes when you get some of these people on. It's great to talk to them and hear how down-to-earth and fun they are on the show teaching squid dissection alan well i won't say teaching i say blagging my way through a squid dissection practical <laughs> but you're still teaching i am still teaching uh, in, in the year 2021 i taught one person how to dissect one squid excellent do you want to know who it was go on it was larkin circumstances around the squid dissection were a little bit unusual mm-hmm. uh, and it wasn't planned in any way shape or form but i still executed it with utter professionalism and like i'd been doing it for years <laughs> she learned it, a lot that night it's not how you usually acquire a squid but when a squid presents itself to you, don't miss the opportunity. Exactly. To be fair, I think it was only half a squid. But anyway. <laughs> it's the important part. Every day's a school day. You can always dissect yeah. a squid. Greetings, listeners. Larkin here, your local salty sailor with another tale from the high seas. And I just so happen to have a squiddy story perfect for this episode. But first, I need to set up the scene. It's nighttime on board the pressure drop, and we've had this submersible out in the water all day. We're now in the delicate process of retrieving the sub, so all hands are on deck. We've got people on the A-frame, people operating the crane, up in the bridge, on the deck. Everybody's out. It's probably one of the most intense times on the vessel is retrieving this delicate equipment right from the water. So everybody's out. Everybody's on the radios. Everybody is really focused. And then over the radios, I hear this calm and it's Tyser, one of the sub team. And he's yelling, we need the professor on deck. We've got a squid in the hatch. We've got a squid in the hatch. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like a squid's in the hatch. Whoa, like this is going to be some Leviathan creature from the depths, right? Like some probably some new species or something, right? And so I'm super psyched and I, cu- I go down to like the deck where the sub is. And instead of it being this huge like monster creature that, you know, the Tyser's like, you know, wrestling against, it's this little itty bitty squid that's no bigger than like four inches long. I mean, it was tiny. And so there's that happening, which is hilarious. And then, of course, the professor never missing a beat. He always takes the opportunity to teach us sailors a thing or two. And so he does an impromptu dissection. Like he takes it into the lab and just dissects the thing really quick. And I learned something new. I learned that squids have this what's called a pin. Um, and what it is, it's almost like looks like an inner, like a spinal cord or something. That's what it, it looked like to me, just like a, like a thin, like, like a needle or something that was, you know, like a couple inches long. And what that is, it's the outer shell. But then over time, then it just becomes like this little pin that's actually on the inside of their body. So that was something that was really cool that I that like I learned just like out on deck. Yeah, you never know what you're going to learn or what funny situations you're going to end up in. Because I really thought like it was going to be this 40 foot tall, like monster with tentacles and the beak and everything and like Tice was just fighting for his life but really it was just this little itty bitty cute teeny weeny little squid hope you all had a wonderful holiday and hope you all enjoyed that story you never know what you're going to find on the high seas until next time bye bye We also had a chat with Mike about busting some of the myths around the monster giant squid. But there was a time when we knew these creatures existed and we knew so little about them and we entered their world so seldomly that it was a genuine worry. And that time period was Don, basically, during his dives during the Trieste. They had to have a contingency plan. They had to think about the then real possibility of running into a giant squid and what might happen. Hello, this is oceanographer, explorer Don Walsh. The subject of today's program is the embrace of the squid. In 1962, I had been the uh, Navy commander of the deep diving man submersible Bathyscaphe Trieste. Our program was what lawyers like to call an attractive nuisance. For example, if you had a swimming pool in your backyard and you didn't have proper fences, 
and somebody went in there who was not in your family and injured themselves, the lawyers could make a claim of your having an attractive nuisance. Well, the Trieste was something of an attractive nuisance in that uh, there are only two of these things in the world. These manned deep submersibles. The U.S. Navy had one and the French Navy had the other. And so uh, we got a lot of visitors. For the three and a half years I was head of that program and Trieste pilot, uh, we had, I think, about three to four Nobel laureates come by just to see what we're doing. It was something new and shiny and nice way of approaching problems of exploring the deepest parts of the ocean. A pair of visitors I had, uh, the two scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It was late in the afternoon. We were sitting around the office having some coffee, maybe a little bit of red wine, and uh, discussing sort of the what ifs of operating at great depths in the ocean. We're not talking hundreds of feet or thousands of feet, but maybe miles down in the sea. And I kind of casually mentioned giant squid. Not much was known about the giant squids at that time. It was more anecdotal and mythology and folklore and so on. And I sort of offered a, an opinion or a thought. I wonder what I'd do if one of them grabbed onto me because the bathyscaphe is essentially an underwater balloon. So it doesn't have much heft, if you will, in the ocean. It's designed to be uh, neutrally buoyant, which means even a small force can push it around. We can imagine if you're embraced by a giant squid, what they could do, it might take you to places that you really didn't want to go. So, uh, you know, it's kind of science fiction conversation. Well, they took it seriously. They said, well, how do we keep it? How do we hang on to it? So that was sort of the difference between, I guess, a true scientist and somebody who's trying to operate a machine at great depths and stay safe. Nothing came out of it. And in fact, their interests were never tested, or I should say their hopes and my fears were never tested during the times that I was operating the Trieste, piloting the Trieste. And in subsequent years, actually, Navy operated the Bathyscap for 25 years, and there was no indication we'd ever had a problem with giant beasts under the sea. However, in 1967, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, man submersible Alvin, which was rated for, I think, 6,000 feet in those days. It's been upgraded over the years. Now it's capable of, I think, 14,000 feet. It was attacked by a swordfish on the bottom at 2,000 feet. And it's quite a commotion outside. This poor creature got its sword stuck in the fairing around the hull of the Alvin and couldn't get away. And to just be absolutely cautious, the crew and the surface of the sub, and it took them about two hours to get the fish free of the uh, submersible. And then it was taken to the ship's galley, and subsequently the crew on board ate it. And since it was a 200-pound swordfish, they probably had many more meals from that same source. Looking back on this pseudo-adventure, something that never happened to me, I wondered if, if the Trieste were embraced by a giant squid. Could I have one of the puppies? Well, folks, that's all for now, and thank you very much for listening. And that concludes this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. Happy New Year, everyone. Feel free to get in touch and have a chat with us. We're fairly approachable. We're, all our social media is in the show notes or our email address. And just say hi, if you like it, if you hate it, if you have any particular questions, if there's anything we haven't explained very well, or if there's anything you'd like to know more about. You know, maybe you've seen some strange article that you think, oh, that can't be true. We'll love to dive into it for you. And it's just nice to meet listeners. We've had some really nice interactions, probably one of the most rewarding parts of starting this project. And so until our February Valentine special, Love in the Deep Sea, we'll deep see you next time. And we have this you already. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by a company, Armatus Oceanic. If you would like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can support that with technology, know-how, help with planning and scientific knowledge. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience, we can help with fact-checking, storytelling and presentations. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone. I'd, I'd like to actually start a few minutes after nine because I have a robot that's programmed to start at nine and it makes a lot of noise <laughs> and I can't stop it until it starts. So. That is the best excuse ever for delaying for a few minutes. We'll a allow robot that. that won't shut up. Can I ask a really dumb question? Yeah.
What was the robot for? For vacuuming the floors in our apartment. <laughs> I was so sure it was going to be some amazing deep sea tech, and it's the Roomba. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a Roomba. <laughs> a very noisy Roomba. Ah, there goes the robot. That's an industrial one. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't even want to talk about it. I just want to wait till he gets started so I can turn it off. <laughs> I don't, I don't think you've got a healthy relationship with your robot. <laughs>